Uh, my name is Susan Gudenkoff. I'm with the Customer Advocacy Dis uh, Division of Global Support Services with VMware. Thank you very, very much for coming. We really appreciate it. Um, I'm going to introduce you to Patrick Carmichael in a minute, but one of the reasons uh, I'm up here introducing him is because this session is, um, is obviously very technical, but it's also a session that we typically run during our customer support days. So we have global support services customer support days all around the Americas, and I'm responsible for that strategy. And we do them across the world. Um, so we do 16 of these events in the U.S. and Canada each year. And what it is is it's a, a technical event and a way for you guys to come out to the field. We fly our engineers out. You can meet with them, talk with them. They do these, these presentations at those events. And then you can also sit down with them and talk with them. We have Ask the Experts over lunch. Um, we, we do a lot of different technical things. And you get to talk to, right to the guys that are dealing with this stuff in and day in and day out with, with, uh, you know, with other customers. So if you have an event near you, um, he'll show a slide that's got the, the website on it. But I highly recommend you, you try and go if you can. If you can't go because there, you know, there's only 16 a year, we can't hit every region. Um, we're going to be doing a virtual customer support day event, so it'll be online. And we'll have some of the same topics, too. They're, they're very technical. They're, the topics are usually decided by the customers what you guys want to hear. So I, um, that'll be probably around November. So when he shows the slide about the customer support days, you know, jot, the, jot the website down. You can take a look, and you can register online for that if there's not one in your region. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Patrick Carmichael. He's one of our senior escalations engineers. Very funny guy. This is a great session. We had about 700 people in there yesterday. Packed room. So um, have a great time and, and wow them with your <laughs> knowledge. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. My name is Patrick Carmichael. I'm a senior escalation engineer for VMware's Global Support Services. Um, the appropriate disclaimer up here, of course. We're going to skip right past that because nobody really cares. Uh, I represent Global Support Services again. We have four main centers across the globe. If you call in because something's broken, you want to chat with somebody, get some ideas on how to do something, chances are you'll talk to one of those four centers. If you're looking for localized language support for several of those locations, you'll chat with the appropriate support center there instead. But that's not what you're here to hear about. Today you're here to hear about VMware storage best practices. Now if you've been to one of our support days in the past, there's a ch good chance you're going to have seen a version of these slides. Traditionally, we write these as, here's what you do, have multiple paths to your lawn, please don't overload your disks, so on and so forth, and they can get a little bit dry. So instead, this time around, and my clicker's not working. Excellent. There we go. This time around, we took a slightly different tact. Today, you're going to hear about how your peers, how your coworkers, how your friends, and how possibly even your family have done things very, very wrong and how not to follow in their footsteps. So without further ado, just because you could doesn't mean you should. Lessons learned the hard way in VMware storage best practices. We're going to touch a little bit on performance, a little bit on SSD, VI, VMFS, then provisioning, and then we're going to talk about a concept called architecting for failure. It sounds pretty interesting. It's even more fun than it sounds. So to start out with, we're going to talk about performance. When I started at VMware five years ago, we uh, standardly saw the, uh, two gig fiber gradually moving into four gig fiber and one gig ethernet. Since then, 10 gig ethernet's become a very, very common standard, 40 gigs coming soon. We've got 10 gig fiber channel over ethernet, NFS is running on 10 gig, iSCSI is running on 10 gig. So I was going to ask one of you guys what you think the best combination of technology and interconnect up there is going to be the fastest, what would be the answer? Someone. FC, NFS. Answer. I don't care. I can make every single one of those perform identically. I can make an MD3000 run rings around symmetrics. I can make a NetApp run rings around symmetrics. I can make a symmetrics run rings about around both of them. It doesn't matter. NFS, fiber channel, FCOE, take your pick. Whichever one you're more comfortable with, whichever one you guys have invested in, it doesn't really matter. The reason for that is payload differs from commands a second. If you think about your traditional architecture. Let's start with something simple. Single host, single LUN, single virtual machine. Anybody here running that? Yeah, I didn't think so. If you look at it from an array perspective, that's going to look a lot like a physical host. It's sending somewhat sequential commands, maybe a few random here and there. It's something the array can deal with. Now make it two VMs on the LUN. You got some stuff interspaced in there. Cache can still deal with it. It can handle it, but still somewhat sequential, something the array is designed to do. Now let's go to a real environment. 40 hosts, 50 LUNs, several hundred VMs. What does the array see? 
We're sending it 100% random I.O., differing sizes, different locations, different LUNs from different uh, initiators. The array hates us. We're giving it the absolute worst thing we could possibly be sending it. And vendors have had nightmares for the last five years trying to find a way to build to handle that. End result, you run out of speed at your disks well before you run out of speed anywhere else. In five years, I have had one customer, one singular customer, that had an interconnect limitation. And these guys had an architect that must have been a genius. They were running it to the point they were using NPIV because they were overloading Cisco high-end switches on fiber channel simply from the load of several SQL boxes, dedicated HBAs for those. But that's one customer out of something close to 8,000 that I have talked to in those five years. For everybody else in the world, your disks matter. And that's all that matters. Why is that? Disks are slow. They suck. It's a piece of spinning magnetic media rotating around a spindle, coming around to a magnetic head that should be hanging out right above the head, pulling data off of it as it loops around. Current max speed of rotating media is 15,000 RPMs. That hasn't changed in 15 years. Why? You spin it any faster, it makes a really amusing sound as the thing breaks the speed of sound, and then it shatters. Shattering disks are fun. Not really good for your data. Physical limitation we can't exceed, so instead we started packing them denser. We throw more platters in there, we make the platters denser, we make the size bigger. We've jumped from 140 gig SAS disks to two terabyte, three terabyte plus SATA disks. All great, but bigger slower. So as we're increasing the load, we're sending worse and worse IO streams to these arrays, we're putting slower and slower disks in them. RAID, who here is not using RAID at all? Yeah, that's what I figured. Everyone uses RAID, it's great, because it means when you lose a disk, things survive. You get more performance when you're doing RAID 10, stuff like that, you have redundancy. But RAID has a penalty. Any RAID type is going to have a write penalty, which means that when we're writing I.O. to it, we have to write that across multiple disks. That means not only are we now sending a random I.O. stream, which your array hates to it, it's trying to write that I.O. stream and multiply it two, three, five times over to get it to the disks and the media. So now you took already slow disks, and are feeding it something that they really hate even more because you're dumping more and more data to them versus what you're actually sending from your VMs. The numbers don't mean anything at first. If you think about it, from a workload perspective, they start meaning something. Read versus write percentage. I'm not going to stay on this slide long because the percentages and the numbers and the math get a little annoying. There's a thousand and one calculators out there for this. In reality, look at this. If you're doing 80% read, 20% write, your penalty doesn't matter much. We've got a difference here of 80 IOPS between RAID 10 and RAID 6. But on the other end, 80% write, 20% read, 720 IOPS versus 400. Still, not something that really means anything in the real world until you get to looking at it from the other side. 1,200 IOPS, it's a pretty standard mid-range SQL server, mid-range exchange box, a few thousand mailboxes, so on and so forth. Maybe a small to medium-sized VDI deployment, very common number we see. We see people building for 1,000 to 2,000 IOPS. 15K SAS drives, 150 IOPS per disk. A little conservative, you can probably squeeze those up to about 200, 220, maybe buy yourself 250 with a good array cache. But still, 150 to 250 commands a second max. Looking at 20% read, 80% write, which is good for a standard database, RAID 10, you're going to need 14 disks. RAID 6, you're going to need 40. Who here's got enough spindles in their array that they can dedicate 40 disks to every database they need to run? It doesn't happen. We rely on RAID cache, we rely on caching systems through SSD, similar things to that, to try and deal with those spikes, to try and handle the load and make it easier on the disks. But in the end, if you're putting more into the cache, more into the array than what the disks can take out of that pool, it's the same thing as the old analogy everyone hears about trying to put 50 pounds of something into a 20 pound bag. It doesn't work. When you run out, the thing will fall flat on its face. Great example, we had a customer call in, they'd spent a million dollars on an array, uh, had a large SQL exchange and VDI deployment they were planning on building. They went, told their vendor, who very politely listened, that they needed 50 terabytes of space for what they were doing. The vendor said, hey, that's easy, we can do that. Sent them a very high-end array stacked with SATA disks. They met the goal. I mean, the quote asked for 50 terabytes of storage. 50 terabytes is easy. I can do that in a machine at home. Um, customer set up the environment, fired everything up, started loading it up, and the array died. And by died, I mean all the connections dropped, all the hosts disconnected, and all the VMs crashed. Okay, that's weird. Vendor says array's fine. Let's fire it back up again. 
repeat four or five times. They call us. We look at it and go, well, from our perspective, everything's great, and then it just disappears. What do you have in there? Oh, 100 SATA disks. So by our math, you're running 50 high load SQL exchange box, or SQL boxes, 20 exchange boxes, and 2,000 VDI desktops. You've got 11 commands a second per VM. You can do a great proof of concept if you boot them one or two at a time and then leave them there. But that'll never run. End result, customer goes back to vendor, buys another array. Talk to your vendors. When you're quoting out purchase orders, when you're building environments, tell them not only how much space you need, but most importantly, what you're going to do with it. Every one of your vendors out there, there's not a single one on that floor down there, if you go to them and say, I need 50 terabytes of storage and I'm gonna run SQL and Exchange on it, they're gonna listen. They'll give you something very different than if you tell them, I need 50 terabytes of storage. What about SSD? SSDs are awesome. I love SSDs. SSDs. You see vendors down there advertising 10,000 plus IOPS per disk. We've got a couple down there that advertise 400 to 500,000 IOPS per PCI card, something similar. And then you read the fine print. Fine print will say something along the lines of sequential aligned 512 byte reads only, or sequential 4K 30% read, 70% write aligned only. So that's great if you're running one workload and only that workload. I had a customer who spent over a million dollars on a brand new array, stacked it out, the entire thing was SSD shelves, $150,000 per shelf. Customer or vendor had promised 120,000 IOPS per shelf. So they had designed a 20,000 seat VDI deployment around this. They fired it up, they got 200 VMs on there and the thing died. Called us, we looked at it and said, well, from our perspective, it's doing great and you power on about another 50 past that point and it runs out of performance. That's impossible. Vendor promised me 500,000 IOPS total. Get on the phone with the vendor. They say, okay, well, what's your workload? Oh, we're running VDI. Well, yeah, that shelf's good for 1,000 IOPS for VDI workloads. How many of you can go to your boss and tell them that you just spent a million and a half dollars on an array and you gotta go buy 20 more of them? Whoever raised their hand back there, I wanna know who you are. <laughs> and I wanna know where you work. Cause it doesn't happen that way. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> SSDs are awesome, but they're designed for specific workloads and every single SSD solution is designed for a different workload. We can tune ESX, your vendors can tune their arrays, their SSD platforms for many, many workloads. But out of the box, they're not gonna come tuned for all workloads. Please talk to your vendors, talk to us. There are things we can do to make these work better. But most of all, test your workload on their platform before you pay them and get your product. If you don't, you may find out that it can't do quite what you expected it would do. And that goes for standard arrays too. Proof of concepts are great. Array vendors love it because they can show off all the neat stuff they want you to buy. But make them show it to you. Because that fine print, if it bites you, costs you a lot. Let's talk about Vi. Everyone here know what Vi is? Okay, see a bunch of nods, see a few shaking heads. Vi is a feature we introduced with 4.1. Uh, enhanced it in 5.0, there's some more enhancements in 5.1. Vi lets us offload certain operations to the array. We advertise it as a way to improve performance of certain operations. If you ever tried eager zero thicking a two terabyte disk, Traditionally, that would have taken hours on most platforms. Sending two terabytes of zeros to the array, it seems slightly bored by it, but it takes a while. Instead, we can ask the array to do it for us. Please zero out block A to block Z. We can also tell it to copy A through C to this location over here, and it does a great job of doing it because arrays like moving data. That's the entire thing they're designed for. However, Vi doesn't reduce load. We've had several customers make this mistake. We had one that was doing vCloud deployments. They were uh, thick provisioning uh, multiple VMs. They'd clone out 50 at a time uh, when needed. Vi came out. Excellent. Our array now has Vi capabilities. It'll be faster. We can up it to 100. Disks were capable of doing about 60. So that first night came around. It went to provision out everything, and they came back in the morning, and the entire environment was down. I was like, well, why? Vi should have worked. Like, Vi, Vi, Vi worked perfectly. We asked the array to do an enormous amount of stuff and it did it until it ran out of speed and then it gave up. 
Offloading operations to the array makes things faster from our perspective because we're not having to send individual block commands. It doesn't make things faster from the array's perspective. It's having to actually do more work than it was originally. Offloading these operations can push your environment past the tipping point. Next Vi command, atomic test and set, ATS. Raise your hand if you had problems with SCSI reservation conflicts in the past. Always get a lot of hands on that one. They sucked, didn't they? Reservations were lousy. ATS is the final solution to reservations. Traditionally, we used a SCSI 2 reserve on a volume when we had to update the metadata. And this meant that we locked the volume to a single host until the release was sent so that we could change something in the metadata and you wouldn't have conflicts between the two hosts. If the release never made it, if a failover happened, if the sun decided to rise in the east that morning, if you had bad luck, if you had good luck, things would go wrong. Reservations are great because they're very, very simple. They're horrible because they're for the entire volume to one host and the release system doesn't give you the ability to query state before sending it. So we can't just send more of them. End result, you get a reservation conflict that's lost, you got a whole volume that goes offline, all your VMs crash except for one host that can talk to it, and you call us and we have to fix it. So we designed a new SCSI command. Our vendors implemented it, and now we can lock individual blocks. Literally lock the blocks in the metadata that we're trying to modify instead of locking the entire volume. This is a really, really good thing. ATS works wonderfully. As a result, you can massively increase your consolidation ratio on LUNs. This is good. Before, if you were using vCloud, Lab Manager, Vue, you'd run into reservation problems because every time we had to expand a linked clone disk, we had to get a reserve on the volume, increase the disk size, allocate it, write some zeros, and then release it. That takes a while. ATS locks just what we need, off you go. However, just because you could doesn't mean you should. ATS will not in any way, shape, and or form guarantee that your underlying spindles can handle double the VM load you used to have on there. The thing we often forget is that link clones are very, very small, but they take up a lot of I.O. We had a uh, wonderful governmental customer. They were running a large VDI environment. Um, set it up, ran into reservation problems on the array. Their consolidation ratios with link clones were to the point that the array literally couldn't keep up with the number of reserves and releases. 4.1 comes out, they install it. A Few months later, array vendor releases a firmware that supports ATS. Reservation problem goes away. They're overjoyed. Time to roll out the extra set of VMs they've been waiting on doing, approximately double what they used to have. Well, we're not having a reservation problem, let's throw them on the same LUNs. They've got, you know, 500 gigs free per LUN. Anybody see where this is going? Nowhere near enough spindles. Link clones small. Desktop still, still sending plenty of IOPS. End result, array goes down. Once again, we get the call, and we look at it and go, well, you've got way too many VMs on there. But we're not having a reservation problem. No, you're having an IOP problem. I can't make it go faster. Disks only spin so quick. Shrink down the consolidation ratios. Sorry. Doubling your VM count doubles your IO load. Now we toss in VMFS5. Oops, sorry, ATS only volumes. Forgot I added this slide. ES65, we added an additional new feature, and this exists in 5.1 as well. Traditionally with ATS, if you have an ATS failure several times in a row, we fall, fall back on using SCSI reservations. We figure maybe the array's having a problem, can't do ATS. Let's send a reserve instead. It's actually a decent method of handling a failure. The unexpected side effect was that if your storage array has an issue all of a sudden, all your hosts suddenly fall back to swamping it with enormous number of a reservation conflict or reservation requests out of nowhere. End result, array chokes. In ESX5, if you create a new volume using VMFS5 where the array reports it supports ATS at the time, we will flag the volume as ATS only. This is good. It means if ATS fails, keep trying. It's a lot less resource intensive than doing reserves. Please don't throttle the array with reservations. That's a bad thing. The side effect that we didn't predict was that people would change things or reuse old hardware. We've had several customers who took older arrays, moved them to a DR site. How many of you have enough money to build the exact DR site you want to build? You're lucky, sir. I can't count the number of customers who've said, well, you know, the array's getting old, but we can ship it off to the DR site. It'll work perfectly fine there. That's true. 
works great. SRM's happy. Your VMs are happy. Your boss is happy. You just saved him a lot of money. You set up a bunch of new volumes. They get flagged as ATS only. Set up SRM or your disaster recovery product of choice and get ready to fail your LUNs over to your DR site. And the array on the DR site doesn't support ATS. Comes up as an ATS only volume. The host go, well, I'm not touching that. I can't do anything with it. Nothing mounts. VMs are down. Boss is unhappy. You call us. Fortunately, we have a fix. If your array at your DR site or if a firmware update or something similar disables ATS on your array, follow this KB here. There is a way to switch the flag back off. We've had several calls on this. Several customers have ran into this. One who was actually in a disaster scenario and forgotten to test it beforehand. Please double check it. If it supports ATS, you're golden. If not, this KB will fix it. KB is currently unavailable for a moment for brief updating and editing uh, before getting republished. It should be back by the end of the week. Wait for the last person to take a picture. VMFS5. VMFS5 is our new third generation distributed file system. It's awesome. Introduces, or introduced with vSphere 5 and eliminates the 2 terabyte minus 512 byte limit. This is great. All of you who had, had to use extents for large file servers or uh, dynamic disks for RDMs and so forth for big workloads, this solves that problem. I like it. Up to 64 terabytes in size for PRDMs, one meg block size, don't have to worry about block sizes anymore. Size limit on VMDK still counts for the moment because that's the limitation of SCSI 2. Uh, we'll get to questions at the end. And we've got a GPT partition table on it, which means that if you've had that wonderful thing where, like any shared file system, concurrent modification wipes out the partition table, we now have a backup copy. We can fix it. Really easy. This is all good. But just because you're allowed to use massively large logical units doesn't mean they're always a good idea. Just because you could doesn't mean you should. When you combine ATS with VMFS5, you can consolidate absolutely massive numbers of VMs on single or maybe a couple large volumes. Let me propose to you here a slight scenario. Customer has an old server, getting a bit older, time to take it out of production, gonna throw it off into a DR data center or something else like that. You pull your fiber channel HBAs out of it, put them into a newer box, because hey, four gig fiber is still four gig fiber, it's plenty good. I mean, we already talked about the fact the interconnect doesn't matter that much. Plug them in, hand them off to the Windows team. They're going to go do something creative with it. They plug it right into the fiber switches, right where they were. Power it on. Throw the Windows installer disk in. Windows comes up, and you forgot to unmask the LUNs or unzone it from the old array. So it promptly sees the VMFS volumes and overwrites half of them installing Windows. Windows guys are happy. VM admins, not so much. Now then, if those were 300, 500, maybe terabyte LUNs, you're going to spend a few hours restoring from backup maybe half a day. What if it's a 64 terabyte LUN with your entire infrastructure on it? I bet your boss is going to ask you what kind of tent you want while you're staying in the data center all night over the next three weeks. Just because you can do very, very large units for sticking a whole lot of VMDKs on doesn't mean you necessarily should. There are absolutely reasons to use very, very large LUNs. If you've got a 10 terabyte file server, I would much rather see you using a 10 terabyte physical mode RDM than sticking five two terabyte ones or 10 one terabyte ones together in a dynamic disk or LVM. Not that I don't like either of those, but this is much, much simpler to manage. However, the bigger it is, the better a target it is for human error, mistakes, failures, so on and so forth. Nothing like sticking an di installer disk into a decommissioned server and accidentally overriding something. It happens a lot more often than you think. Another scenario. This one was uh, actually quite amusing for us, uh, not so much for the customer. Doing a secure wipe on an array. They've got five LUNs they need to wipe. So they take a server, an old one, plug it back into the fabric, doing hard zoning. It's only supposed to see the array it's wiping. Your switch guy made a mistake. Got the WWPNs wrong. What used to be an old ESX 3.0 server promptly goes out and sees the very, very large symmetrics that it was not supposed to see that it saw six months ago. Turns out secure wipe works just as well on a large symmetrics as it does on the MD3000 you were about to decommission. <laughs> yeah. There goes two weeks of restoring from backup. And no, your data recovery company cannot recover from a secure wipe. That's the whole point. Then provisioning. 
Anybody here have enough storage space to do everything they want to do in their environment? Please raise your hand. Okay, for those people who raised your hand, all the rest of you, please go beat them because I'm in the same boat as the rest of you. Nobody ever has enough space. There are always people who want to come up with things to do with VMs. It's so easy to make them. I mean, hey, we can go test this real quick. I need five terabytes. Thin provisioning is the answer. Thin provisioning is great. I use it every day. It allows you to modify and manage your storage after the fact. You don't have to give somebody an actual five terabyte chunk of space. You can give them less and as it grows, deal with it then. Especially great if you have processes, you know. If you're installing XYZ that requires a 300 gig LUN be presented, even though it's only going to use five of it for the next six months. I can't count the number of software packages out there, especially on the enterprise high end level that say, I need this much space. Yeah, but you're a test box. It's not ever going to actually use that. Still needs that much space. Or groups where it's like, we need 500 gigs. This lets you deal with that. Big question is, where do you thin provision? And what does it mean when you do thin provision there? There are two places to do it. Step one is at the VM level. Hit this one easy because this is the one I got control over. I can tell you about it. When you thin provision a VM disk, we start at zero bytes, grow up by the block size as it's used. You got a one meg block, we grow up by one meg does have a slight performance penalty. We do have to modify the metadata to increase the size of the disk. Generally, it's very, very slight, given that you generally you go out and install something, build your database, whatever you're going to build, it takes up so much space, doesn't grow, shrink that much. Therefore, we're not modifying metadata all that often. But there is a minor performance penalty for the first set of writes. Disk cannot currently be shrunk. There are some cute and creative workarounds for that, but they're kind of annoying. We're working on that. Don't worry, we know it sucks. So, what happens when you run out of space? Because you will eventually run out of space. Anybody who says you don't, that's saying about, you know, there's those who have and those who will, you're one of them. When you run out of space, we stun all your VMs. They stop. We literally pull them off the scheduler. They don't get cycles until you fix the problem. Good news is that's really easy to do. Go set a couple memory reservations to 100% so we get rid of the swap files. Go delete a couple snapshots. Go free something up. Yank an ISO off of there. As soon as you've done that, we will resume every one of the virtual machines right where they left off, and you will never see data loss. Well, almost never. Some things that are sending data might get a little confused. Your clients will disconnect. Your boss might be irritated. But everything is still there, and we can get it back up and running really, really quickly. That's good. What about the LUN level? I use this too. I'm never going to tell you not to use thin provisioning in either place. Thin provision loans work differently per array. It allows you to share resources between groups. When you got guys who are asking for huge RDMs and never going to use them, when you're testing software out, um, VDP, we just announced it. When our guys were beta testing it, I was serving out their storage. VDP comes in 500, 1 terabyte, and 2 terabyte sizes. They were asking for 2 terabyte LUNs. I don't have 2 terabytes of space lying around. So thin provision the LUN, here you go. Let me know if you're going to use more than 100 gigs, because that's all you got to actually work with. Work great. Process designed, defined LUNs. You're doing Oracle rack testing, something similar to that. It doesn't like small volumes. So set up your big stuff, use thin provisioning. Bob's your uncle. So what happens when you run out of space? We have a new feature called Unmap. It's a Vi primitive introduced with five. Let's you know, or lets ESX know, there are no free blocks. If it works, which currently it is disabled due to several vendor requests and several problems we've had with it, uh, if it works, we'll do the exact same thing we did when, your ran out, when you ran out of space on a thin provisioned VMDK. We'll take all the VMs off the scheduler, let you go free up space, and then resume where we left off. Bit harder to free up space because now you've got to find space on the array to give it. Takes a little bit longer, but we can do it. What if Vi is not available or still disabled? On a good day, everything crashes. Hard. Web servers, generally not that bother. Desktops, your users get a little annoyed. Databases, chances are you're doing a database rebuild. But it's still there. Yes, a database rebuild is a good day. Can anybody take a wild guess what the bad day slide is going to look like next? Pretty sure that's exchanged near the top. I see an Oracle rack note somewhere over there on the right, and that's a sequel there, that little dot. Rampant massive corruption. Arrays and VMs don't really like block writes failing mid write. If it happens to be a metadata update that's on its way to the array when it runs out of space, well, you might just have VMDKs that go totally missing. Can't update the pointer table to it. Gone. 
Lun thin provisioning can get you into some really, really unique situations. I showed this slide a, uh, a couple months ago at a support day in Edmonton when I was at TAM Day two days ago. One of my customers from there came up to me and said, yeah, so you remember your presentation? You remember the picture of the nuclear explosion? I was like, okay, so what was it? SQL? Exchange? SQL. Did I tell you? Yeah. You're going to remember this time? Yeah. Please, don't turn your environment into that. We call these resume generating events. <laughs> RGEs. Um, goes with the five R's. Rescan, refresh, reboot, restore, resume. We can't fix that if it happens. I'm never going to tell you not to use thin provisioning. There's massive reasons to use it. Please, think of where you're going to do it. Make a decision. I don't generally recommend doing it on both, and on thin doesn't get you a whole lot, except doubling your management overhead. But whatever you do, understand that it increases the management workload of your environment. If you've got a storage guy who's doing it all on his own, he needs to set up alerts. I don't know of an array vendor out there that doesn't have the ability to alert you when a thin provision LUN is running out of space. That being said, I can count on my one hand the number of customers that have those set up before that prior slide happened. I've got some thin provision LUNs where the alarm's set at 30% because the crazy dude that's using it will probably suddenly decide to dump 50 gigs of cat images to it. Set them up. Use them. VC has alarms built in as well. You can have it alert you any point in time you want ahead of time so you avoid that prior slide. I hate those calls. They always start with, do you have backups? And when the answer is no, I hear tears. New Vi features. Details are there. Um, there'll be a similar post for the, new, the slight tweaks in 5.1. Um, any more details you want to know that will be there. So, everything we covered so far is new technology. Now we get to the really fun stuff. Has anybody here read some of the blog posts and things out there about Netflix's Chaos Monkey? Saw a few hands. So Chaos Monkey is an interesting idea. They uh, wrote a program that basically asks like an, it acts like an enraged simian pounding keys into their entire environment. Whatever breaks, they fix. Makes it better. This is a similar concept. The ultimate extension of just because you could doesn't mean you should is called architecting for failure. And no, I'm not telling you to build your environment to blow up and die. I'm telling you to build it so that when it does blow up and die, you know how to fix it. Architect for the failure. Consider each piece of your physical infrastructure. Where does I.O. go? Comes from a virtual machine, goes down a SCSI bus, hits a switch, goes to an array. Comes from a virtual machine, goes to a networking card, out from there. Where does it go? What does it hit? What happens at each one of those steps if it breaks? How do you recover? What do you do? Black box testing is the basis from which you start this. Literally, take an environment. Take, pretend it's a black box. It has inputs. It has outputs. Feed it data. Feed it inputs. If you feed it something that's good and it comes out good, great. Feed it something bad. See how it reacts. Literally, chaos monkey. And then feed it something stupid. Invite the janitor in to see what he can do to it. Whatever he breaks, have him fix it. Please don't actually do that, but concept. Chaos Monkey's goal was to go out and literally see what random inputs they could spam to everything in there and what would result. Great example, we had a customer with a very large VDI environment, had a group of developers using it. Occasionally they had to open up very large Wireshark traces. If you've ever seen what it takes to open up a one or two gig Wireshark trace, it takes a good eight gigs of RAM. Their little laptops had two gigs of RAM in them. The desktops were configured with one and a half. Simple solution. We'll let the developers increase the RAM on their desktops. They're all smart guys. We can remind them to go decrease it afterwards. Oddly enough, despite the fact that users are often idiots, it worked great. People go in there, bump up the RAM on their desktop to 10 gigs, reboot it, open up whatever they needed to do, run the processing, shrink it afterwards. They made one mistake. They gave the users permissions on the resource pool all the desktops were in instead of just the virtual machines. We get a call. For some reason, this VDI pool is now sending 50,000 IOPS to their array. The Symmetrics is crying. The Oracle guys are irritated because they have no performance left, and they have no idea what's wrong. It's supposed to send about 5,000 IOPS. One of their users had gone in, increased the RAM on his desktop, Late at night, gone back to decrease it, and accidentally cut the resource pool for 350 VDI desktops to 1.5 gig memory limit. 
the impressive part is it actually worked pretty well. Once the Symmetrix was done crying from the fact that we just swapped out 300 some odd gigs of RAM and started using it as RAM instead for the vSwap files. As long as nobody opened up something new, I mean, everyone had Word open and Excel open and a couple other things, it was great. As soon as they opened up something new, the Symmetrix started crying again, everyone else dragged to a halt until we balanced out the memory and life went on. It took us a day to figure out what had happened. Just reset the memory limit, read a crap load of data in from the Symmetrix back into memory, everything goes on. Think about what your users can do. Look at all your permissions. What inputs can they give it? Does it make sense for them to be able to do that? If they make a mistake at that, you know, 12.30 at night, been working all night, totally fried, out of Red Bull, what is it going to do? How do you correct for that? This can be applied before or after you build your environment. For those of you who read XKCD, this is a classic cartoon, perfect illustration of the concept I'm trying to teach you here. Little Bobby Tables. What can your users, what can people, what can other folks do that will break your environment and how do you fix it? So, individual components. Hardware is really easy to compensate for. Every server now pretty much comes with two power supplies, multiple network cards, multiple paths to the array. I still get calls from people who have one path to their array and wonder why in the world when the switch died it dropped the connection. I'm missing a unicorn and a fairy here to get the bits, sir. Don't know what you want. I get that call. People expect that we, because we do amazing stuff, that somehow we have a way of doing it. We don't. Um, virtual fairy does not come around until version 8. Sorry. Um, please, use multiple NICs. Set up failover. Use the redundancy stuff we have built in. Fault tolerance, HA, VMCP. Brand new feature in 5.1, if I go and kick one of your servers and knock both of the HBA cards out of it, we'll fail the VMs over that we're using that storage to a host that has it. There are even enhancements coming to that later on. There is amazing stuff we can do, but so many customers don't use it. Don't get me wrong, I know HA in the early 3.0 days was pretty bad. It's not anymore. Use it. It will save you. VMCP and the rest of it makes it even better. When you're considering your I.O. path, sometimes it passes through a single point of failure you don't realize is one. You got multiple NICs, multiple HBAs heading out to your array, and it all goes into a single SSD cache. What happens if that goes away? Just saying. So, individual components, easy to compensate for. Please do. What if your problem's a bit bigger? Katrina, New Orleans. Hate these events. I got a call from a customer wanting me to help them set up SRM. Said they had to get it done in an hour. Like, okay, <laughs> why? Well, Irene makes landfall in an hour. You started replicating yet? No. How much data you got? 30 terabytes? Got a station wagon? Yeah. Grab the disks, start driving. <laughs> Never underestimate the bandwidth of a station wagon hurtling down the highway with a very, very determined army sergeant behind the wheel. <laughs> so. What happens if you have to boot your strap your environment cold? Most of the time, despite that last picture, the smoking crater example we normally use when talking about SRM, that's not what happened. If smoking craters happened as often as we have problems, well, this would be a very different place. That being said, biggest one we run into, environment's down cold. Walk in, data center's cold, room's off, no lights, no nothing. UPS didn't work, generators didn't start. What do you have to do to get it back online? I can't count the number of data centers I've walked into and says, okay, so where's the run book? Run book? The book that says, here's how you shut it down and here's how you turn it back on. Well, don't you just flip it on? You want me to push the button? Let's find out how well that works. No, no, no. Please, think about how to do this stuff. It happens so often. We had, um, I, I love this call, actually. It was absolutely great uh, listening to the guy talk. Um, environment goes down. UPS didn't kick in. Generators didn't kick off. Major sports team, game coming up in about four hours. Okay, well, why don't you just turn it back on? Well, we did that. Nothing's working still. Okay, hosts are up, yeah. Arrays up, yeah, yeah. Switches turned on, yep. Okay, so do uh, you know an IP address? Well, no. DNS servers are down. Okay, where are the DNS servers? Well, they're on the array. Okay, let's poke around, find an IP for a host, get into it, and it's like, okay, so I'm not seeing any of the storage. Oh yeah, well, the storage is mounted by DNS. Okay, so the DNS servers that you're referencing for mounting the storage are on the storage. 
all right, well, let's restore your VC server, start getting this stuff connected back up. We'll figure out the IPs on the array by some Christmas miracle. You've got them in a class A subnet with thousands of possible IPs, but we'll find them. We'll figure it out. Oh yeah, you're using a DVS, which because VC is down because it's on the storage that's mounted by, NF by DNS, the, the DNS servers are down because they're mounted on the storage. Can you see where this is going? What should have been a one hour phone call at most to start rebooting a bunch of virtual machines turned into six hours. The outage extended into the critical period because circular dependencies had been introduced to the environment. Think about what it would take. What order do you have to bring things back online to get your environment up? This happens way too often. We like to believe the generators and UPSs work great, but they never do when you test them. And most of the time when you test them, it's when you actually really, really need them. I can say this myself because it's happened to my lab more times than I can count. How long does it take to get back up? Once you've figured out what all you have to do, how long does it take you to walk through those steps? Is that an acceptable period of time? Is the boss going to finally snap because he hasn't had email in that long? Make those decisions beforehand, and it makes it a lot easier after the fact. Permanent site loss is not always an act of God. Far more common is the failure of a single major component, entire core networking, your array lights on fire, etc. I have actually gotten that call. Hi, my array's down. Okay, what happened? Well, it's on fire. Grab a fire extinguisher. What are you calling me for? I work for VMware. Uh, we thought you could help. Fire extinguisher, go. Um, another one called in. It's like, yeah, so uh, both of our arrays are toast. What happened? Well, there was a thermal failure. Why are you calling me? Can you recover the data? Is it working? Well, no, none of the drives will spin up. No, I can't. Did you have a plan for this? Well, no. Call the vendor, please, not me. Can't help you on that one. Human error. Talked about the good old HBA swap. We had another really, really interesting phone call, actually. Customer called in. All my virtual machines are gone. Gone? Yeah, they're gone. None of them are there. Well, what'd you do? Nothing. <laughs> I can't count the number of times I've heard that. This time, actually, the customer had done nothing. Sat around, poked around, looked at it, it's like, well, somebody logged in as root to this machine and went through each of the virtual machines, did a power off and a delete, then into this machine, power off and delete, and this machine, power off and delete. They are indeed, sir, gone. Oh, can you get them? No. Human error happens. Malice happens. Plan for it. Have a way of getting it back. Fortunately, those guys did have backups, and it didn't take too long to recover. You got multiple recovery options for whatever happens to your environment. We make this, and our partners make this, a pick your choice of what you want. Backups, tested and verified. Who here has backups? Thank you. For those of you who didn't raise your hands, shame on you. Who here has tested their backups? For those of you who didn't raise your hand two times in a row, you don't have backups. How long does it take to restore? We had a customer call in. Yes, too long's off in the answer. They had had a critical array failure. Everything on the array was corrupted. Standard line, okay, how's your backups? Expecting the worst. I've had customers crying on the phone, CEOs crying. It's like, well, that's everything we've got. That's, that's our entire company. We have nothing left. I unfortunately lack the tools to magically suck data out of thin air. I'm sorry. This case, the answer was, yeah, we got backups. We tested them last week. They were great. Let's start restoring. VM starts spinning up, slowly spooling off tape. It's like, all right, so how much do we have to restore? 55 terabytes? Okay, let's do some math. 50 weeks. Can you guys be down for a year? Well, we're a major government institution, so no. Call your vendor. You got to order about 20 servers and about 20 more tape drives. Let's get this rolling. If your backups take too long to restore, they're the same thing as non-verified backups. They don't exist. Um, think about how long it takes. We used to have a statistic up here, it's out of date. If you have an outage that lasts more than a week, 75% of companies that go through that don't exist after two years. Array-based replication and site recovery manager, 5.1, this is even more amazing. It's incredible technology. And most of all, host-based replication. You don't even have to have an array at your DR site. Got a remote office with a bunch of servers sitting there with SATA disks? It'll work as a DR site. They may not be fast, but at least they'll exist. Existing is far, far better than poof. 
Please, we make options to get it to the point where you don't have to lose everything. Use them, plan for them, test them. If you haven't tested it, it doesn't actually exist. And that way, when we have these conversations about, do you have backups? So your primary site's under 10 feet of water. So some rampaging bull just went through your data center. That was a fun call. Um, you got a way to work around it? Yes? Sweet, let's start rolling that out. You're back up and running. You're happy, I'm happy, boss is happy. You go home at the end of the day. Whatever your disaster recovery choice is, make sure the RTO is something you can live with. If it isn't, you're gonna be in trouble. Architect for the failure. Make the plans ahead of time. Build the run books. Your life will be easier. My life will be easier because I don't have to get those calls from sitting there going, I really want to help you, but there's nothing I can do. Everyone goes home happy. Questions? We've only got a few minutes. I apologize. This went a little bit longer than normal. Go for it. Just, I, I, I wanted to clarify something you said about thin provisioning and what yep. happens you know, in, the, in the failure situation. Yep. So if you've cut a 500 gig lawn or you know, whatever size lawn on the sand, it's not thin, thin provisioned with the block. Lawn. Yep. Like 500 gig, right? So if you set a thin provision disk and for, you know, for 40 gigs, whatever, you know, and it you know, fills up to 40 gigs or, or the, well, the LUN, I mean. LUN's full enough that the 40 gigs hits the end of the LUN. The, yeah, it, at 39 gigs, you're uh, yep. trying to ask for 500 for LUN out of the yep. uh, it, The VM stuns, it yep. just waits for disk to be freed up. Yeah, a little alarm pops up, VM stuns, we take it off the scheduler, thing pops up and says, hey, I'm out of space, right. please click here when you're done. Earlier, just, uh, somebody's gonna be calling the help desk. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you pop back in, you get some space, you click the thing that says, I fixed it, and hit go, VM resumes. Okay. Question was, what's the standard IOPS for a Windows 7 standard VDI deployment? Um, it ranges depending on what all you have installed in the guest. I have seen anywhere from 25 to 100. The 100 ones had a lot of monitoring tools and other stuff installed in them by regulation. Average is somewhere around the 30 to 40, maybe 50 range per VM. That being said, obviously users can go way above and beyond that when they start doing weird things, and users really like to do weird things. But if you're planning for an average, say 50. 50 is a good solid stab in the dark. Yes, sir? When would you not use storage IO control? That's a great question. Never, which is why it's turned on by default in 5.1. Um, it logs a lot. If you're sharing disks with physical boxes, something like that, uh, if you're sharing disks or LUNs between virtual center instances that aren't linked mode for some reason, then yeah, I wouldn't use it, otherwise the alarm was gonna keep going off when other things access it. Honestly, at least in a monitoring state, for, for so forth, SIOC is great. I wouldn't necessarily always set caps or limits on virtual machines unless I needed to, much like I don't normally believe in setting reservations and limits on VMs for memory and CPU unless needed. But there's going to be some really, really neat stuff coming with the, the software-defined storage with SIOC and so forth and the profile-driven stuff there that makes it even more critical. So go ahead. Because everyone always makes a mistake with it. Um, then on, th huh? Oh, uh, sorry. The question was, why do, why do I not recommend using thin on thin? A, you don't get really much of anything. Because um, we can't do unmap at the moment, neither one of them is going to shrink. So you don't get a whole lot of benefit. Um, if you're really that pinched on the array, I can see doing it. The biggest problem with it then is you've got two places you have to manage. You have to worry about the LUN running out of space and you have to worry about the VMFS data store running out of space. And it always turns out that somebody forgets an alarm somewhere, you make a mistake somewhere, and now you've got two places that blow up. Given that you don't save anything much on the array side, I just don't see a point to it with the management overhead. Um, if you need it, I do have a couple places where I'm doing it because I had to, but it's not something I'm overly fond of just because it doesn't buy you much and it is a massive, massive pain in the rear to keep going. If your storage only does thin, then make sure you set up your alarms. <laughs> please, please set up your alarms. I've had customers who's like, so you're gonna not do thin provision anymore? No, no, we're not gonna do that anymore after that outage. Three weeks later, so we had another outage. Still doing thin, huh? Yeah. <laughs> alarms, 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 email's great. Everyone carries a Blackberry or an iPhone or an Android phone now. Sir? What's the new feature you talked about when you have storage and 
Uh, it'll be SRM, it's Site Recovery Manager with Host-Based Replication. Um, you can literally make a DR site out of a bunch of leftover workstations or, I mean, Dell's got, for an example, the T310 server, it's like 400 bucks. Stack it with some SATA disks, buy five of them, HP's got an equivalent, IBM's got an equivalent, you know, something that's just on the HCL at the absolute bottom end, set up host-based replication out to it, and you can replicate a significant portion of your production environment, at least your most critical stuff out there. It'll be dog slow with a bunch of SATA disks in there and no shared storage. You won't have vMotion except for enhanced vMotion and so forth. But it's better than not having anything and everyone almost seems to have in a remote office somewhere where they got a closet they can stack some of these things and replicate to it. And the new licensing schemes for SRM are cheap enough that it's not that hard to justify the cost for saving everything you've got. It really isn't. Slow is better than not existing. I mean, you can, I've done some amazing tuning things with, with virtual machines when we've had to do stuff like that, pulling off things with SATA disks locally and so forth. We can run it, it'll at least be there. Go ahead. Very, very similar. Um, I'm not familiar as much with, as familiar with Veeam solution, uh, given who I work for. Um, but <laughs> it, it's the same concept. I don't, honestly, Totally honest here, I don't care which one you use, just please use one. If you want to go with Veeam, if you want to go with NetApp's uh, Snap Manager, if you're going with Clarion's replication technology, if you're going Recover Point, just have one. We'll help you make whichever one it is work and make sure that it's something that'll save your bacon because to us, it's far, far more important that your data's still there and that your virtual machines are still there and thus your applications are still there than it is which replication technology or disaster protection technology you went with. Uh, I have a philosophy of using NetApp snaps. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. Our array vendor thermal event that I talked about, the one that didn't catch on fire but melted, as the chillers failed, the data center was located in the middle of the desert in New Mexico. Um, as the chillers failed and the temperature, uh, our temperature sensor stopped functioning at 185 degrees to give an idea how hot it got in there. Um, as it went bad and as the arrays cooked themselves into oblivion, they replicated their bad data to the customer's DR site. How do you deal with that? You have backups. That's what they ended up doing. They had off-site tape, uh, which is what saved their bacon. Because yes, an array that is cooking will gladly replicate bad data to a DR site. Any array vendor. If you, if you ask an array vendor, if I cook your array to 180 degrees, what's it gonna do for replication? They're gonna look at you and go, we have no idea. It's gonna probably send a bunch of garbage. Still, it's, I mean, the replication itself is functioning at the block level. It's copying blocks. Whether you're using NFS, which from our perspective is file-based, or VMFS, which is block-based, the array's replicating at the actual block la layer. Oh, yeah, yeah. NetApp uses 4K blocks, so it'll be replicating 4K blocks across, and as things go bad and you get the corrupt blocks there, it'll gleefully replicate them, because the things that are checking that to determine whether it's bad are also cooking and going bad. And the whole thing, you're in a failure state, a complete and utter failure state, where none of the checks, none of the sanity steps, nothing's gonna work correctly because your, your array's basically melting. So I've had that happen three times, three different customers. So yes, it will go bad. SRM is great, but it's not, I would always prefer it be used in conjunction with backups instead of just one or the other. Go ahead. There are two main issues with SSDs in our world other than the, the only work for specific workload as well. One, MLC garbage collect. Nobody's using SLC cells because they're way too expensive, they're way too small. Garbage collect means you send a sustained workload, they eventually start doing garbage collect, performance tanks by 75%, and you, if you're sending enough work, it never recovers, because we never get it out of the point where they get it. The other one's RAID. If you're doing RAID on SSD, we have really, really good backups, have a good disaster recovery strategy, and pay attention to the MTBF and how many writes and reads your disks are getting. SSDs fail by design because of how they work. You're physically breaking and reforming silicon links. 
they will eventually have a failure. They contain excess capacity to deal with cells that start going bad, but by rule, they have a much narrower MTBF than traditional media, which means that as they start to go bad, you will have a higher chance of having multiple discs go bad at the same time. Be on it. If you're going to do it, make sure you got the spare SSD so the second one goes bad, you can slap in a replacement, have good backups, have a good DR strategy just in case. There are absolutely reasons for, to run RAID and SS, or SSD and RAID. Um, if you're doing true high performance computing and stuff like that, that's the only way to get that type of performance unless you're doing a massive RAM LBA range for something with SRP. But they are touchier, for lack of a better way to put it. Yes. Yeah. Those apply no matter what, but SSDs normally have a lot more capacity to soak it up. So I like, I like SSD RAID. It has its purpose, but you do have to stay on top of it a little bit. It's a bit of management. Um, as long as you get ahead of it, make sure your disks aren't getting too worn out, you're golden. So any last questions? From our perspective, from a straight technology perspective, it doesn't matter. Um, VMFS5, a array capable of ATS, will be able to handle, from a pure metadata management perspective, almost any number of, of VMs. Please note, um, we've had customers come and try to put 50,000 on there on one LUN. That doesn't work so well. Within reason, I've seen anywhere from 20 to 200, all of that range functions fine. The, the file system itself can handle that. The question is, what can you handle if said LUN gets overwritten by a SAN admin who had a few too many drinks, or by bad luck, or your array just decided to make said LUN disappear? That did happen once. Um, nobody ever figured out why. If something happens, what's the impact there? The more that are on there, the bigger the impact. The more you have to restore. Also, the more load concentrated on a single LUN. What's your RAID set behind that? What disks back that LUN? What do they share? The more that's on there, the more you're pushing through the pipe. Single queue to the LUN, the more you're trying to put out the HBA before it reaches the array. Single queue on the front end of the array. It all depends on what, what, your rest of your, what the rest of your architecture is. There's no f perfect answer there. Traditionally, in the past, we had published numbers for that because there were limitations with VMFS as to what it could handle and by far what the arrays could handle for reservations and metadata updates. And honestly, especially on our part, on how the locking system worked for them and how many uh, particular locks the metadata could handle at a given time. We have to update those locks, heartbeat to them and so forth. Now, not much of an issue, which is why we don't have numbers out there, but it, it really depends on what you've got. Anything else? I do not. <laughs> Working on that. This is my <laughs> this is my first attempt at writing something interesting and fun and so forth. And so far, it seems to have gone pretty well. Did y'all like it? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> One last question, real fast, and then we'll be done. Yep. Yes. Yes. There have been so many questions over the years over, hey, this is neat, but you kind of left out the other half of the equation. Trust me, we know. It'll be fixed. No. <laughs> nope. <laughs> Go. And we took, and if I remember right, in five, it stopped doing that. <sighs> I know it was. Trust me, I, I, I wish it was there at times because I got a couple of virtual machines that I accidentally named new virtual machine two. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, let me check on that. Let me get you one of my cards and I'll find out what our current stance on that is. There's been a long standing debate over whether that was a bug or a feature. Um, just saying. So I will check on that and find out what our, where we're going with it. I don't honestly know because I haven't looked into it in a while. Everyone, have a great day. Enjoy the rest of the show. Glad you had fun. I'll talk to you later.